Good morning. Welcome, everybody. My name is Elliot. I get the awesome privilege of working with the students, the middle schoolers, the high school students. Let's give it up for them. They were up here. Very talented, hardworking students, and I'm, I'm very honored to get to work with them on a daily basis and, and also honored to work with the amazing volunteers that we have uh, who work with them as well. A couple announcements before I wanted to get started. I did the keys thing already. Uh, if you reach into the pocket of the chair in front of you, there's a card like this. It says connect card on one side and prayer card on the other. If you could at least fill out like the prayer card for us, that would be awesome. It helps us to, uh, to pray for you and minister to you and your family better. And it's just such a valuable tool that we, we really look forward to getting each and every week. Raise your hand if you, uh, if you volunteered at the Barbecue Bash this week, this weekend. Very good. You guys are awesome, and we are so grateful for just being a light in the community, uh, which is what we're called to be. And so we're thankful for, um, for you guys stepping into that role. Before we get into uh, any of this this morning, I want you guys to turn to your neighbor, turn to the people around you. Uh, real quick, answer this question. Who's the most trustworthy person you know? You won't get in trouble for talking in church. Don't worry. Who's the most trustworthy person? We'll, it, we'll pretend like spouse is already number one, so you don't have to worry about that, or hopefully. Somebody else, who's the most trustworthy person you know? Go ahead. You guys ever play with BB guns when you were a kid? I did, sometimes. My parents weren't cool enough for me to have one, but my best friend Mike did, and I, mom, sorry, she's probably watching this later, sorry about that. But my friend Mike, my best friend, had a BB gun, and we would always go over there and play in his backyard. And I just remember, as a kid, like cranking it as hard as you could because, you know, you wanted to go through the cat, and it was just such a good time, such a fun time. It was probably better that we didn't have one, because I know I was an annoying enough little brother that my older brother would have totally hit me with the BB gun, like on a daily or weekly or hourly basis. I don't know. I deserved it probably more often than that. But then in high school, I was in ROTC, and that's like Army Club, if you're not familiar. In high school, it's, for my high school, it was Navy, because we're way better or something. But I was on the air rifle team. I actually got a varsity letter in air rifle. So I wasn't like the captain of the team or anything, but I had like a little medal that went on in my uniform, said I was a marksman. So I was, you know, not half bad. So who believes that I can hit that on the first try? Anybody? Raise your hand. Any believers in the house? All right. Keep it up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. That's a lot of you guys. I appreciate you guys have good faith. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. If your hand is raised, who is willing to hold it for me? Okay, slightly fewer. Okay, mostly fewer. All right, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Who is willing to hold it in their teeth? Some of you. You got one. We got two. Anybody else? Come on up here, Jeff. I actually have a waiver for you to sign. So go ahead, read through that real quick, and then sign on the bottom. And then, you got the idea. Huh? Right here? Yeah, right here. I want you to, yeah, take it off, pluck, okay. pluck it off there. There you go. And like then turn around. Yeah, sure. Okay. Turn around so that they can see your wonderful face. But you want to stand in front of this, like we just painted, so we want to oh, protect yeah. that. No, okay. turn the other way. Like that. There, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, so the trick was uh, take like half a step back, backward. Perfect, yeah. When I was a kid, I accidentally shot my sister near the eye with an airsoft gun, but this one's going to be on purpose. I'm just kidding. I can't do this. Guys, come on. <laughs> Give it up for Jeff. Thanks, Elliot. Appreciate that. I'll take that. But here. I want to show you guys that I totally would have hit it. That's what the board is for. Maybe it's better off. Believe it or not, there's a point to all this. 
For, I'm not just some random guy who borrowed a BB gun and then decided today was a good day to get fired. <laughs> for all of us in this room and outside of the room, it's easier for us to say something than it is to act. It's easier, us, easier for us to believe something than it is to put that belief into practice, into action. Sometimes that happens on accident. My youngest daughter, Lennox, is almost 11 months old, and she's like a day and a half away from taking her first steps. And I am so confident, I believe with all of my heart, that if she finds herself in front of a staircase, she will try to climb it. I also believe with all of my heart that that's a terrible idea. But sometimes I forget to put the baby gate up. On accident, my beliefs and my actions don't really line up. But sometimes it's more on purpose. I fully believe that speed limits exist to protect drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists and motorcyclists and everybody else on the road, but I also fully, fully believe that nine times out of ten, I am late, so y'all better get out of my way. <laughs> and as long as humanity has been around, sometimes our actions and our beliefs, we've had this tension where they don't always line up, either on purpose or on accident, through our own choices or just through circumstances or forgetfulness, our Beliefs and our actions, what we say and what we do, what we believe and what we act, don't always line up perfectly. And one of the earliest letters that we have in the New Testament in the, from one of the earlier followers of Jesus speaks to that point. And if you guys are with, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open to the book of James. That's where we'll be starting today. We're going to be in James chapter 1. While you guys are flipping there, if you're using uh, one of the brown Bibles under the chair in front of you, I think it's on page 977, James is almost to the end of the, book, end of the Bible. And while you guys are turning there, James wrote this as a letter to Christians all over the world back then. And James was actually the brother of Jesus. And while Jesus was around, while Jesus was alive, he didn't buy into the whole Messiah thing. And think about it, you probably wouldn't either. If my older brother, who was about to shoot me with a BB gun, if my older brother said to me one day, hey, little bro, just want to give you a heads up, I'm God, so no big deal, just, you know, do whatever I say, you better believe I'm checking him into a psych ward. And I bet that you guys would do something similar. James, while Jesus was alive, didn't want to have anything to do with him. Just like, oh, that's my crazy brother Jesus, just rattling off and going around Galilee, doing whatever. But then something changed. And he becomes a believer in Jesus, and he becomes one of the most important leaders in the early Jesus movement after Jesus was gone. Because he saw his brother die. He saw him hung on a cross, stabbed in the heart, buried, and then he saw him alive again. That might change my mind about my jerk of a brother. And it might change yours too. So we're going to be in James chapter 1. Uh, and we're going to start in verse 22, but before we do that, I want to pray. God, thank you for um, everything you've given us, for the ways that you're working in our lives, in our hearts. Uh, I ask that you would just speak to us through your word, God. Help us to hear what you've written. Help us to understand what you've written it for. And help us to, uh, to follow you, even if it's tough, even if it doesn't make sense, even when, it's, when we can't wrap our heads around it, God. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 22. But don't listen, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Your translation might be like a little bit different than mine, and that says they will be blessed in what they do, but it's, it, they're close enough. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody who's obviously not listening? It, I've got three kids under the age of six, and so just like sometimes getting the sound waves to enter their ears seems like an impossible task. So much so that we like actually got my son's hearing checked, and guys, unfortunately, it's fine. And if they listen, if they hear what you're saying, it's next to impossible to get them to actually do it. It takes like an hour to get everybody up and dressed and out the door. And when I was a bachelor, man, it just like roll out of bed, hit the, hit the floor and just go. It's gone now. No more. And if you've been around teenagers at all, you know that sometimes they're like masters of like covert texting. Like they're under the table, like just... 
They're so good these days, like they don't even have to look. They're just texting in all the time. And us grown-ups are like way more obvious about it, like right on the dinner table, just tapping around and swiping through Reddit, doing whatever. We've all been on both sides of those conversations where somebody's not paying attention, somebody's not listening, somebody's not engaged, and it's really, really obvious. And since we've all been there, James uses that as uh, an introduction to what he's saying. Again, James 1, verse 22. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. That word listen, that word listen is important. James was a Jewish kid, grew up as a a Jewish person and learned from rabbis and learned about the Torah and the Old Testament, and he would have known that listening was a big deal. Listening was a big deal for the Jewish people. In fact, one of the central tenets of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, comes to us from Deuteronomy. And it's in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have been praying this prayer every morning, every evening, as a prayer to God. Hear, O Israel. Listen, O Israel. And that word is important. It's, it, in Hebrew, it's Shema. Everybody say that with me. Shema. It's a fun word. Shema. Very good. That's how we get, this is called the Shema, because the first word, Shema. It makes sense, right? It's, it's such an interesting word. It doesn't just mean like sound waves entering your eardrum and vibrating things to communicate words and language and stuff like that, but it's so much more involved. It's an active kind of listen. It's an engaged process. And there's no separate word for obey. It's just Shema. So if you're telling somebody, I will listen to you, and I'm going to obey what you're telling me to do, I'm going to follow through, you just say Shema. It was an important issue, an important thought in Jewish life. Shema. And Jesus emphasized the same thing all throughout his ministry. He, 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 he shows us that God's a loving God and he's full of grace and mercy and love and joy and he's doing whatever it takes to pursue us. But at the same time, he, show, he calls all of his followers to this radical obedience that we should be committed to him and to the Father above everything else, even our own families, that he is one to be obeyed above everything. And it's really easy for us sometimes to want to pick one side or the other. And, try, and we want to maybe pick every, all the little factoids out of the Bible and we want to study it really deeply and we want to learn all the interesting things and all the intricate ways that it's weaved together and we want to learn a lot and keep all that knowledge up here. But then when it comes to doing it, maybe? Yeah, maybe it's probably a good idea that we should obey the things that we know and we should probably listen to what Jesus says. And yeah, I probably do them, but if we don't, maybe it's not such a big deal. Or maybe we, we want to just dive in to obedience and say, yeah, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm doing what, I want, what you tell me to do. But how are you going to know what he wants you to do if you don't listen to what he says? For the Hebrew people, for Jesus, and for James, listening and doing go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin, and they can't be separated. And if we try to separate them, if we try to just do one or the other, or do one at the exclusion of the other, then we really only have half of the gospel, one half of the message of Jesus. And we're fooling ourselves, James says. We're deceiving ourselves if we try to do listening without obeying or obeying without listening. They go together like peanut butter and cupcake. That's one of my favorite children's books, by the way. Listening was a huge part of the Jewish faith, and it's, we have to ask ourselves, are we really listening? Now, we need to pause here for just a second, because I, I don't want to misspeak, and I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that what we do earns us God's grace. Under no circumstances do I want you guys to walk away hearing that from me. What we do does not affect our standing with God. That is His grace, His the blood of Jesus has already done that for us. But what we, we obey in response to that grace. We obey out of an abundance of love for God because of what he's already done for us. We obey as a response to God's grace, not as a means to earn it. Make sense? So James says, listen and obey. They work together. Okay, cool. But if you guys are like me, I like to think in pictures. So James gives us a picture. 
We're actually going to look at two, but the first one comes right after what we already read. And the, it involves a mirror. And one of my favorite mirrors in all of humanity is the mirror in Snow White. I don't remember watching that as a kid, but if I did, I'm pretty sure I would have been terrified. Like the face comes out of like flames or something like that. I don't know. Uh, Non-rhetorically, what is the face in the mirror doing? Not rhetorical. Quest answers welcome. What's that? Reflective. Very good. Very good. What, what's the face in the mirror doing for her question? Answer. Answering it. But it's not just answering it, is it? It's telling the truth. That's an important part. And we know that mirrors reflect reality. We know that mirrors, their one job is to reflect reality and answer our questions in a sense. She wants to know who is the fairest in all the land. And she's hoping that it's her. But this mirror, I'm assuming, can like see everything, which is even creepier. And it can answer her question, and it tells her the truth. It tells it like it sees it. And the mirror is reflecting the truth. The same way that mirrors we use do the same thing. I, as I look back at my high school and middle school years, I think that's the time period that I spent the most time in front of the mirror. Because everything's got to be perfect. You've got to make sure that no hair is out of place. There's no pimples showing or anything like that. Or else you've got to make sure that you're calling in sick or something, faking sick so that your parents don't send you to school. My excuse was always, my head just feels like it's going to explode. Bought it every time. Sorry again, Mom. I spent a lot of time in front of mirrors, and it always reflected what I, what I was seeing. It always reflected reality very objectively. In the same way, James uses this mirror picture to talk about God's Word, what it does for us. So let's start James 1, verse... 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. James is setting up this like fascinating, interesting comparison between these two guys. One of, and, and a lot of things are compared. A lot of things are different between the two of them. What they look at, how they look at it, the, the results that come about from their looking at it, all different, all fascinating. And if we were talking about a, like if we were in a biblical Greek class or if we were talking in a seminary somewhere, we would totally go into like the fascinating, interesting, unique things about this passage. But today I want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And all that interesting, like fascinating stuff is just a detour anyway. What James is comparing between these two guys is the result of them looking. The guy who looks in the mirror, the result is that he walks away forgetting what he looks like. He walks away not doing anything about what he sees. The result of the guy who looks in the law, what he calls God's perfect law that sets us free, God's word, the message of Jesus, the guy who looks at that walks away changed, having done something, having put something into practice. The guy on looking at the mirror is listening with his ears. But the guy looking into God's word is hearing with his heart. We have to do the same thing. Don't just listen to God's e word with your ears, but hear what he's saying with your heart and let it put, put it into practice. The one man looks at the mirror, walks away forgetting, not changing anything. The other guy looks at God's word puts it into practice, changes what needs to be changed, and does what needs to be done. If you're like me, mirrors might not do it for you. you, you I learned long ago that it's just not much I can do here, so I just don't spend much time in front of mirrors any longer because it makes me sad. So maybe houses and like engineering kinds of things do that for you. This next picture comes to us from Jesus, and if you're following along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. And Matthew 7 comes at the end of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Most famous sermon ever preached by anybody was Jesus. And there's a lot of teaching, a lot of cool stuff that he says. And at the very end of it, he's, he's given out all these teachings, all these words of his. And at the very end of it, he says this to his followers. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. 
But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds, on a ho- builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Now, some of us might read this and think, that seems like maybe a little bit unnecessary. Like, okay, don't build a house on sand. I'll add that to my to-do list. It kind of just seems like it makes sense, right? But Jesus and his followers lived in the desert. There's a lot of sand around. I've lived in the desert. I've been there. There's a lot of sand in the desert. Surprise, right? And for the people who Jesus was talking to, it was easier, it was cheaper, it was faster to build just right on top of that sand, right on top of the the weak stone that had just sort of condensed. It was easier, faster, cheaper than to drill down and dig down deep to the bedrock, the solid foundation. And and to to a certain extent, it makes sense. Like, why would you even bother? For both houses, built on the sand, built on the, on the rock, both houses look the same from the outside. You're not really going to be able to tell how deep the foundations are if you're just looking at them. Both houses are going to fulfill their housely duties. Duties. Both houses are going to look and act pretty much the same for the most part. But Jesus tells us it's the storm that's going to tell the difference. It's the storm that's going to make a difference in the life of whoever's living in that house. My family and I just got back from a vacation. We went to Gulf Shores, Alabama, and my very generous father and mother-in-law rent out this this beach house, and it's them and all four sisters and three sons-in-laws and like 26 million grandkids, it feels like. It's just chaos and a lot of fun. But as we read this, this, uh, this lesson that Jesus is giving, house on the rock, house on the sand. I can't help but remember the beach houses that I saw. And I get so like fascinated and like my ADD takes off and I like hyper focus and like I can't figure out, I have to figure out how these houses work. And so I I brought some pictures that I wanted to share with you guys. This is a house that is built, this is Dauphin Island, it's like next door to Gulf Shores from where we were. And this house is built on what are called pilings. And that's those like stilt looking things. And those pilings are driven like down, down, down into the sand, like 20, 30 feet into the sand until there's a firm enough ground that they can be built on to support the structure of the house. This, this picture was actually taken after Hurricane Katrina in 05, I think. And this house, as you can see, has withstood the storm. There's some minor damage there on the side, but overall it's still standing. Looks like it did a pretty good job. Looks like the pilings went down far enough. There was enough of a firm foundation that the pilings did their job. But then there's this other house, also on Dauphin Island, also after Hurricane Katrina. That one doesn't look too good, does it? I don't know how they like fix that, like get a couple tractors together or something like that. Maybe just like a really strong guy, push it back up. I, I honestly, I don't imagine that that thing is still standing. I can't, I don't know how they fix it or what, but I imagine that that is a pretty devastating effect of the storm. Those pilings didn't go down far enough. They weren't resting on a firm enough foundation. And it's the storm that really tells the difference between the two of them. And the same thing, we have the same choice when we come to God's word. We have the choice to make, are we going to drill down deep into our foundation and put God's word into practice, or are we going to take the easy way out and learn something interesting Learn something fun, learn a factoid or a Bible Bowl trivia question, and just walk away. It's the choice we have to make when we come to God's Word. Do we take the easy way out, or do we let it come into our heart? Do we let it affect the way we act? Do we listen with our ears, or do we hear with our heart? And this is much easier said than done. As I've been thinking about this tension, as I've been thinking about the things that I believe and the things that I do and how those aren't always the same, it's easier said than done. And there's one question that comes to mind. Why? Why is it so difficult for us to put what we believe, what we say, what we know into practice? And often, the things that we want to do the most, the things in God's Word that we want to do more than anything else, are the more difficult ones. Why is that? I think one of the contributing factors is our limited perspective. We live pretty self-centered lives, if we're being honest. 
We spend the most time with ourselves. We know our own experiences. We know what we know, or at least we think we do. We know uh, what we want out of life. We know what we think life should look like for everybody. So our perspective seems like the perspective. And when God's word speaks from a different perspective, from God's perspective, it's confusing. Sometimes we get so stuck in the weeds of our perspective, and we get such a limited scope and like tunnel vision that whatever God says doesn't add up, and we just kind of throw it out. There's, in the 1880s, a dude by the name of Edwin Abbott, whose middle name was also Abbott, I kid you not, wrote a story called Flatland. And we're going we're gonna to get kind of like mathy and sciencey dorky for a minute, so bear with me for just like a minute. In Flatland, there are only two dimensions. You got forward, backward, left, right, X, Y, if you're following along that way. And it's just two dimensions. And in Flatland lives a square, and he's got a, a line wife, and he's got like polygon kids, and there's all these lif- different characters, and they can only see in two dimensions. They don't have a third dimension. Just two. That's why it's flat. Flatland, see? And one day, a sphere passes through flatland. And the square sees it and just like, square mind blown. Just doesn't, can't figure out what this thing is. It was like a circle, but then it was like a smaller circle, then a bigger circle, and it just confusing as all get out. And this sphere tries to explain to this square, there's this other dimension, man. Like, yeah, you got left, right, forward, backwards. You got all that stuff, but there's like this down. You can go down. There's up. You can go up. And he's like, up? What, what is up? And the sphere says, not much, dog. How about you? I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. (laughs) And the language just isn't getting through to this two-dimensional square. And so the sphere, like, picks him up out of his two dimensions, which I imagine would be pretty painful. And he gets, like, a bird's-eye view of everything that he's ever known. And he can, like, see into his house. He can see all of his friends, all of his families. He can see the inside, like, the guts of his family, which I imagine would be pretty gross and disgusting and, yeah. And he has this whole new perspective. And he asks the sphere, what about like, okay, so I get up, down, three dimensions. Got it. Perfect. What about a fourth? Maybe a fifth. Take me to like someone who who knows about more. And the sphere's like, no, dude, no, uh uh-uh, uh-uh, just three, just three. Three dimensions, that's it. And he gets so mad at him for even asking, he's like, you're banished back to flatland. And he probably like hits him in the face on the way. And so the square goes back home and starts telling all his friends, guys, there's this like, different direction that's not forward, it's up, it's down, it's very confusing, but it's there, guys. And they get so mad at him, they throw him in jail for preaching about the third dimension. Seems like a pretty unfair law. But we get into that same perspective, that what we believe, what we know, what we feel, and what we see matters more than anything else. And anything that someone else says to challenge that or anything that God's word says that doesn't quite line up with our own perspective, just out the window. And I think that leads to something much more dangerous, a much deeper problem. I think we trust ourselves more than we trust God. And we might not be willing to say that out loud. We might not dare even think it, but I think we trust God, trust ourselves more than we trust God. Did I say that the other way around? And I think that's dangerous. And whether we admit it or not, when we say, when we know what God wants us to do, and we don't do it, with our actions, we're saying that we know better. I'm guilty of that. I think all of us are guilty of that. We put more trust in ourselves, in our own perspective, in what we think we know about this life, than we trust God. And instead of coming to his word and saying, no, I don't think that's quite true. I think I'm, I got this figured out over here. I think we need to just humble ourselves and say, God, I don't understand this. I don't fully get it. I don't know where we're going, but you say this, so I'm going to trust you. It doesn't add up to me. It doesn't make sense, but I trust that you know what's going on and your perspective is in a better place than mine is, so I'm trusting you, not myself. And if we can do that, just one step at a time, one day at a time. If we can start taking these steps to put our trust back into God and take the trust out of ourselves, James tells us what we're going to get. 
We read this already a couple times, but verse 25. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. What's that blessing piece? Is it like a cool birthday party with all your friends and family? Is it like riches beyond your wildest dreams, a magic genie, anything like that? No, James actually tells us back in verse 21, but we kind of skipped that earlier. So I'm going to read it. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. This message of Jesus, this word of God, this perfect law that gives us freedom. James tells us the blessing is that we have this salvation, that we get to know God, that we get to have a relationship with him, and that we get to affect our eternity for him and be with him forever. The word has the power to save our souls. And that's the blessing. And we, get, and we can get so overcome with this grace, this mercy, this love that he's put into our hearts that we just can't help but respond. We just can't help but serve others and, 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 and worship him through our lives and obey and respond in obedience to his grace. Not because we earn grace, but because we've been given so much grace already that we just can't help it. Now, Jesus, James isn't talking about putting our lives on easy street. And if you guys have been a follower of Jesus or just generally alive for any length of time, you know that life can be tough. You know that life is going to be difficult. There's no way to change that. It's just one of those facts of life. And if, if somebody is telling you that if you could just believe the right things or check the right boxes and do the right stuff or, heaven forbid, give enough offering, then Jesus is just going to rain down power and money and success on you. If you're hearing that, you better be careful. Because Jesus tells us that in this life we will have trouble. In fact, he makes a promise of it. He says just the opposite. And this is the last place I'm going to take you. And then I'm going to land this plane. But in John chapter 16, it's at the end of what's called the Last Supper. And that's, that's where we get, actually, communion. And we're going to actually prepare for communion right now, and we're going to um, come to the table of communion in just a minute. But Jesus is spending his last night with his followers, and they're celebrating the Passover meal. And there's like four or five chapters of Jesus just preparing his disciples for what's about to come, preparing them for the, the trials and the difficulties that they're about to face. And at the end of it all, before he prays, he says this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Life is going to be tough, but Jesus tells us the biggest blessing of all is that we get to live in the peace of Christ. We don't have to let the trials, the sorrows, the pain of life define us or identify us or affect us forever. Jesus has overcome all of that for us. And if we can just take those steps, if we can choose to obey, if we can choose to follow him, if we can choose not just to listen with our ears, but if we can choose to listen with our, hear with our hearts, if we can choose to trust God, then we can expect God to act. And he's going to bring that blessing into our life. He's going to bring that salvation. He's going to show us where he wants us to go. And that's what we all have to ask ourselves. Are we willing to trust him, even when it doesn't make sense? Are we willing to ask him, God, show me the truth about my relationship with you. Show me what I'm doing and where it doesn't line up. And show me what you have in store for me. Where could he be leading you? Where could he be showing you that he wants you to impact others? And what would he have you do? In a minute, I'm going to pray and the guys are going to, the, the ushers are going to come forward and, and we're going to partake in communion. And if you are a follower of Jesus, we invite you to join with us and celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to sign some paper. Just if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to join us. But the prayer that we all have to pray is for God to show us the truth about our relationship with him, about our walk with him. 
Show us the truth of where we are living, where we are acting, and where his word would have us live, and where he would have us act. And they're not always the same. And there's a couple of things I want to invite you to do over the coming minutes. First, I want to invite you just to reflect on what God's word is teaching us today. Where we are listening, where we're obeying, and if the two need to be changed. And in the pocket of the seat in front of you, there's one of these cards. I invite you to, to, to write out a prayer. You can take that with you this week. You can put it in those baskets on your way out the door if you want to, and, and offer it up and say, God, this is what I need. I'm inviting you to step into the story, and I'm showing up. I'm doing my part, and I know that you're going to do your part. And up here at the sides, there's going to be some elders. If you want somebody to pray with you, if you want somebody to pray for you, we invite you to do that as well, to join us and to pray for us. We're going to play some music while we, while we sit and just and allow God to work on our hearts. So let's pray. God, thank you for everything. Thank you for today. Thank you for leading us and guiding us. And, and God, we invite you, we ask you to, to reveal where our lives are, where they need to be changed. God, we ask you to, to show up. We're inviting you into our hearts. We're inviting you to mess up our lives where it needs to be. God, show us where you want us and give us the strength and courage to follow. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.